But the turning point came when someone gave me a book um, called The Bible, Science, and the Quran by Maurice Bukai. And that, that was amazing. Um, it lists so many things in the Quran that were known 1,400 years ago, hundreds of years before they were actually discovered. Um, how did your family react to you coming into the religion? My, my mom, I think she understood the logic behind it. For my dad, however, was a different story. With Islam, it's just you and the creator, and that's it. Uh, the scientific details recorded in the Quran. And for me, that's, what's, that what, that's what clinched the whole thing for me. That's what strengthened my faith, that this was the right I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Almighty Allah be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is Quran and modern science conflict or conciliation. The Holy Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For any book to claim that it's a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for any book to claim it's a word of Almighty God, it should stand the test of time. It should prove itself to be the word of God in all the ages. Previously, it was the age of miracles, Majza. A miracle is any unusual event for which the human beings do not have any explanation. It's any unusual event which is attributed to a supernatural power or Almighty God. The Holy Quran is the miracle of miracles. But for a modern man to accept any miracle, he will first analyze and verify it. Alhamdulillah. The Holy Quran proved itself to be a word of God 1400 years ago. Even today it can be analyzed and verified. And even in future. And it will always prove itself to be a word of Almighty God. It's a miracle of all times. Suppose a person says that he has done a miracle. I like to give an example of Baba Pilot who said that he stayed underwater in a tank for three days. And when the reporters, when they wanted to examine the base of the tank, he said, How can you examine the womb of the mother which gives birth to the child? And he prevented the reporters from examining the base of the tank. Will a modern man accept such miracles? If such miracles are the test, then you have to agree with me that P.C. Sarkar, who happens to be one of the leading magicians of the world, he will be considered as the best God-man alive today. Later on came the age of literature and poetry. Muslims and non-Muslims alike, they acclaim the Holy Quran to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. And the Holy Quran gives a challenge in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 23 and 24, where it says, Wa in kuntum fi ala abdina. And if you are in doubt as what we have revealed to our servant from time to time, fa'tu bi suratan min misli, then produce a surah somewhat similar to it. And call forth your witnesses and helpers if there are any besides Allah. 
but if your doubts are truthful. فَإِلَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا And if you cannot. وَلَمْ تَفْعَلُوا And of a surety you cannot. فَاتَّكُنْ نَارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسَ وَالْجَارَةِ عُدَّةِ الْكَافِرِينَ Then fear the fire which is prepared for those who reject faith whose fuel shall be men and stones. For anyone to try and accept this challenge but natural, the surah they produced should be in Arabic. There are certain surahs with are hardly three verses, hardly three sentences. The surah you produce should be in Arabic. The language should be as divine as that of the Holy Quran, as noble as the Holy Quran. The language of the Holy Quran is miraculous, is unsurpassable, intelligible. It has the highest rhetoric and at the same time, it is very rhythmic. When anyone wants to praise a person or want to glorify anyone, he deviates away from reality. And the best example you can see is in the Hindi movies when the hero praises the heroine and he tries to please her and says, I will get for you the moon, I will get for you the star. The more you try and praise a person, the more you deviate away from reality. Alhamdulillah. Though the Quran is rhythmic, it does not deviate from reality. There were many people who tried to produce a surah like the Quran, but they failed miserably. No one has been able to do it so far, and no one, inshallah, will be able to do it till eternity. But suppose if I tell you that there's a religious scripture who says in a very poetic fashion that the world is flat. Will a modern man today believe? But natural, no. Because today is not the age of literature and poetry. Today is the age of science and technology. So let's analyze today the Holy Quran and modern science, whether they conflict or conciliate. The Quran and modern science, whether they contradict or they're compatible. According to the famous physicist Albert Einstein, who had got a Nobel Prize, he said, science without religion is lame. And religion without science is blind. I would like to repeat it. Albert Einstein said that science without religion is lame. And religion without science is blind. I would like to remind you that the Holy Quran is not a book of science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E, but it's a book of signs. S-I-G-N-S. -S. It's a book of ayats. And there are more than 6,000 signs or 6,000 ayats out of which more than a thousand speak about science. There are some people who will be satisfied just by acquiring one sign. Some people require 10 signs to accept the truth. Some may require a hundred. While the others, even after you produce a thousand signs to them, yet they will not accept the truth. As far as my talk today will be concerned, I will only be speaking about those scientific facts which have been established. I will not be speaking about theories which are based on assumptions and hypotheses. Because we know very well that many a times science based on theories and hypotheses it takes U-turns. In the field of astronomy if you ask a scientist that how was our universe formed? How did it come into existence? So he will tell you about the Big Bang Theory that initially the whole universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation which gave rise 
to galaxies which further split to form things such as our solar system which gave rise to planets, the sun and the present earth which we live in. I start my talk by quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30 which says, Avalam yaral lazina kafiru, do not the unbelievers see, anna samawati wal arda kanata ratkan fafataqna huma. The heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This verse of the Holy Quran speaks about the Big Bang Theory in a nutshell. Imagine, what we came to know today, the Holy Quran mentions 1400 years ago. And the Quran also says in Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 11, that moreover, in his design, he comprehended the sky and it had been smoke and he said to it and the earth come ye together willingly or unwillingly and they said we come together in willing obedience the Arabic word used here is Dukhan which means smoke if you ask a scientist he will tell you that the universe before it was formed, the celestial matter, it was in the state of gas. And the Arabic word Dukhan, which means smoke, is more scientifically correct than mere gas. And according to Stephen Hawkins, who is a very famous scientist, he said, the discovery of bridges of matter in the space is the biggest discovery of the century which gives us undisputable evidence of the creation of the universe and the Big Bang Theory. Previously, the people thought that the world we live in, it is flat. And they were afraid to venture too far, lest they would fall over. It was only in 1597, when Sir Francis Drake, when he sailed around the earth, he proved that the world was spherical. The Quran mentions in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 29. Alam tara anna laha yuliju layla fi nahari wuliju nahara fi layli. It is Allah that merges the night unto the day and merges the day unto the night. Merging is a slow and gradual process. The night slowly and gradually changes to day, and the day slowly and gradually changes to night. This phenomena is only possible if the shape of the earth is spherical. It's not possible if it's flat. If it was flat, there will be a sudden change. The Quran says in Surah Al Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 5, it says, Huwa allazi khalaqa samawati bil haqqi. It is Allah who has created the heavens and the earth in true proportion and he overlaps and coils the night unto the day and overlaps or coils the day unto the night the Arabic word used is kawara which means overlapping or coiling how you coil a turban around the head how you overlap a turban around the head this phenomena of the night overlapping and coiling over the day is only possible if the shape of the earth is spherical. It's not possible if the shape of the earth is flat. There will be a sudden change. The Holy Quran further says in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, it says, Wal ard ba'da zalika dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth X shape. The Arabic word dahaha comes from the root word dhuya meaning an egg shape and it does not refer to any normal egg it specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich in the field of oceanology the holy quran says in surah Furqan, chapter 25 verse number 53 it is allah who has let free 
two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palpable, and the other salt and bitter. And between them there is a barzakh, a barrier, which is forbidden to be trespassed. The Quran repeats the message in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19 and 20. Marajal Bahrain yal taqiyan, baynahuma barzakh la yabgiyan that it is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water which meet and between them there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. The Arabic word barzakh means a barrier and the Arabic statement marjal bahrain yal taqiyan means the flowing bodies of water they meet and mix. Previously the commentators they could not understand the two opposite description of the two bodies of flowing water. It says they meet and mix as well as it says there's a barrier between them. The commentator of the Quran could not explain what did this verse actually mean. It was confusing. Today, we have come to know with the help of science that there is a slanting barrier between the two bodies of salt water and sweet water, between the salt sea and the sweet sea. And whenever water passes from one sea to the other sea, it loses its characteristic and gets homogenized into the water it flows. There is a barrier. But this barrier is called as a transitional homogenizing space or area. Both the waters, though they meet and mix, but the characteristics yet remain the same. Salt, water remains salt. The sweet water remains sweet. And this phenomena can be seen in Cape Point, southernmost tip of South Africa in Cape Town, where salt and sweet water meet, but they are distinct. They don't mix. When they flow across, the water changes its characteristics. Similar thing can be observed in Egypt when river Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea as well as the example of Gulf Stream which starts in the Gulf of Mexico though it flows for thousands of miles both the water salt and sweet water they are distinct and if you're traveling in a boat and if you pick up water from one side of the boat and water from the other side you'll find that both the waters are different one is sweet and the other is salty even the temperature differs. Even in the area of Gibraltar, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean Ocean, there is an unseen barrier. And this was confirmed, this phenomena, which the Quran speaks about, was confirmed by Prophet Zahay, who is a leading marine of USA. The Quran asks the people that which of the favors of the Lord will you deny? In Surah Rahman itself, chapter 55, this verse, then which of the favors of your Lord will you deny, is repeated no less than 31 times. It speaks about the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about trees, about the heavens, and then asks you, then which of the signs of thy Lord will you deny? It speaks about what cycle, and then asks you, then which of the signs of thy Lord will you deny? It speaks about the barrier between the sweet and the salt water, and then asks you, which of the signs of thy Lord will you deny? The Quran in one chapter itself, it's asking its reader, which of the signs of God Almighty will you people deny? It's prodding you that all these signs, from where do they come? Which of the signs will you deny? In the field of physics, there was a theory known as atomism, that atom is the smallest part of matter which cannot be divided. This theory was propounded by Democrats, the Greeks, 23 centuries ago. And it was also known to the Arabs. And the Arabic word for atom is zarrah. But today after science has advanced, we have come to know that though atom is the smallest particle of matter, having the characteristic of the element it yet can be divided into electrons, protons, etc. So people may think that the Quran is outdated. 
the Quran does speak about Zarra and says it's a minute particle. But nowhere does it say that it cannot be divided. In fact, the Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 3, it says that when the unbelievers say that the hour will never come, tell them, it will surely come with the permission of the Lord who has the knowledge of the unseen, who has in his record the minutest detail of an atom in the heaven and in the earth. And in his record is propitious things smaller and greater than the atom. So Quran says there are things smaller and greater than the atom. So Quran is not outdated, it is up to date. The similar message is repeated in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 61, that in Allah's record is propitious things smaller and greater than the atom. In the field of geography, we learn in school about the coherent water cycle. This was first described by Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 and he said, how does water evaporate from the ocean, forms clouds, the clouds move in the interior, how does it fall as rain, the rainwater flows into the ocean and the cycle is completed. Previously people thought in the 7th century BC phase of Meletus, he said that the spray of the ocean was picked up by the wind and it fell into the interior as rain. People did not know how did the underground water, the springs, where did they come from. So they thought that due to the pressure of the winds on the water, the thrust of the winds on the water, it fell into the interior as rain. And this rainwater seeped into the soil and returned to the ocean through a secret passage, the abyss, which was known at the time of the plateau as Tartarus. People believed in this theory of Descartes even till as late as 17th century. And philosophers like Aristotle's theory was believed till as late as 19th century, that water vapor evaporated from the soil, it condensed in mountain cavern, and these mountain cavern formed lakes which fed the spring water. Today we know that the underground water, the springs, it is due to the seepage of the rainwater. And the Quran says that in Surah Al-Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21, Fears thou not that it is Allah who sends down rain from the sky and seeps it in the sources in the ground, in the springs in the earth and causes sown field of various colors to grow. The message is repeated in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 24. Allah sends down rain and dead earth brings it back to life. The Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18, that it is Allah who sends down rain in due measure. We are able to store it and we are also able to easily drain it. The Quran says in Surah Al-Hijr, chapter number 15, verse number 22, it says that we send fecundating winds, wind impregnating, and cause rain to descend from the sky and give you water in due measure. The Arabic word lawaki used here is the plural of laki derived from lakaha which means to impregnate or to fecundate. The winds carrying the pollen, they impregnate the clouds and then rain falls. The wind causes the clouds to merge. There's condensation, there's lightning and rain falls from the clouds. The Quran describes the complete water cycle. How does the water evaporate? How it forms clouds? How it moves in the interior? How it falls down? How it flows back into the ocean? In several places. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 12 to 14, as well as in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. The Holy Quran says, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43, that we send mountain masses of clouds. What does the Quran mean by saying, we send mountain masses of clouds? 
Today, if anyone has been traveling in an aeroplane, he will realize that when the aeroplane goes above the clouds and he looks at the clouds beneath, he will see that the clouds appear as mountain masses. Quran has said this 1400 years ago. There wasn't an aeroplane 1400 years ago. Quran describes hydrology and water cycle in several places in great detail. It's mentioned in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 9. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 57. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 48 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Jashia, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. In Surah Waqia, chapter number 56, verse number 68 to 70. As well as in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 30. The Quran describes the hydrology and water cycle in great detail. In the field of biology, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, Waja'alna min al ma'i kulla shay'in hai. We have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, where there was scarcity of water, the Quran says everything was created from water. Who would have believed in it? Anything else the Quran would have said, people could have believed. Water, where there was scarcity, the Quran says 400 years ago, every living thing is created from water. Today we have come to know that cytoplasm, which is the basic substance of the living cell, contains 80% water. Every living creature contains 50 to 70% water. And without water, the living creature cannot survive. It's a must. The Quran asks you, we have created from water every living thing. Will you not then believe? Allah is saying that everything is created from water which you came to know today. Quran mentioned that 1400 years ago. Will you not then believe? It's asking you a question. It wants a reply. The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, that we have created every living animal from water. The Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 54, we have created the man from water. Imagine, 1400 years ago, the Quran mentions this. Let's discuss the field of geology. Today the geologists, they tell us that the earth we live on the outer crust, it's hard and solid. And the deeper layers, they're hot and fluid and inhospitable for the existence of living creatures. The geologists tell us that the outer crust is very thin, hardly 1 to 10 miles, less than 1% of the radius of the earth, which is 3,750 miles. And the outer crust is very thin and there are high possibilities of it shaking. Today, geologists tell us it's due to the folding phenomena which gives rise to mountain ranges. And these mountains, they prevent the earth from shaking. They act as pegs, as stakes. The Holy Quran says in Surah Naba, chapter 78, verse number 6 and 7, it says, we have made the earth as an expanse, was Jabala Autada, and the mountains as stakes. The Arabic word Autad means stakes, means pegs, which we have discovered today. The Holy Quran says in Surah Jashia, chapter 88, verse number 19, as well as in Surah Naziat, chapter 79, verse number 32. It says, was Jabala Arsaha, we have made the mountains standing firm. There's a book by the title, The Earth, which is a very famous book, an authority in this field, which is referred 
by most of the universities throughout the world in the subject. One of its authors name is Frank Press and he gives the illustration of the mountain in this book called Earth as wedge shaped and he says the function of the mountain is to stabilize the Earth's crust and Quran says that the same information in sorry Ambia chapter number 21 verse number 31 as well as in Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 10 and Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 15 that we have set on the earth mountain standing firm lest it would shake the Quran gives the functions of the mountain 1400 years ago which we discovered today